Let's take a look at various events that are being put together and realize they come in two basic flavors. So basically what I'm asking is, what happens when we want to find the probability of something happening and something else also happening? Putting together these sort of compound events in an unusual way. Let's start with an interesting example. Let's suppose that I take this really cool spinner here. And you can see it's beautiful. I'm going to spin it right now, and I'm going to predict exactly what it is. I'm going to guess red. Let's see if I'm right. Red, red, red. OK, let me try one more time. I'm going to guess a number this time. I'm going to guess three. Three, 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 three. Okay, forget that. Here is the question. The question is, what's the probability of spinning one and then one again on the spinner? So notice this is a question that has an and in it. So doing something and also doing something else. So you just don't have to go through the first hoop of getting a one, but you've also got to get through the second hoop of getting a one as well. So usually, probabilities that involve two events where you have an and, that's actually going to be less likely, less likely, more restrictive, because you have more conditions. Let's see how we'd actually compute this. Well, we want to find the probability that we see a 1 and then another 1. OK? So that's exactly what this is asking. How are we going to figure that out? Well, it turns out that does the spinner know what it landed on? Knowing that I'm on a 1 now, is that going to change the answer as to what I'm going to spin next? Well, the answer is no. Whoa. This actually, this spinner has no memory. So in fact, when in fact the probability of one event, the event occurring, actually has no impact on the second event, we call these events independent events. So two events are independent if the occurrence of one has no impact on the occurrence of the other, as with this question, because the spinner has no idea of where we, one again, wow. So how do you actually find the probability of two independent events happening? Probability of A and B both occurring is the product of probabilities. And let's just notice that what I said earlier actually now seems to be coming true. These are both numbers that are actually less than 1. When we take two tiny numbers less than 1, like a half and a half, we multiply them together, they get even smaller. They become like a quarter. So you can see that as we predicted, this is more restrictive. Probability should be smaller because we're asking for more. So that's consistent with this formula. How would we actually work on this particular question? So the question is, let's actually find the probability. Let's actually find the probability that we see a 1 and then a 1. So the probability of seeing a 1 the first time through? Well, let's take a look at the spinner. Notice that we have a sector of 1 here, a sector of 1 here that makes up a quarter and a sector of 1 here, and a sector of 1 here, and these two eighths together make a, another quarter. So I have a quarter and a quarter. That's a total of a half. So I see that actually the probability of it landing in this eighth, this eighth, this eighth, or this eighth, well, that makes up half of the whole circle. So the probability of landing in one of those ones is 1 half. And then we multiply that by the probability of getting a 1 the second time, which we see, in fact, is still 1 half. So we have 1 half times 1 half, which we see is 1 fourth. And you can see it's actually smaller than just the 1 half. So it's not very likely, well, 1 and 4, that we'll get a 1 followed by a 1. I'll try right now live. Here we go. Spinning 3. So already I see there's no way of me getting a 1 and a 1. I didn't even cross the first hurdle. OK, let's take a look at another example where we can see this in action. The question now is, let's uh, spin a red, then a green, and then a 5 on the spinner. Well, again, the spinner has no memory. Knowing that I have a red, oh, look, I landed on a red. So let's see what this is going to be. So I got a red. Now I've got to get a green. Very unlikely, right? It's not too many greens there. And I didn't get it. OK, so not very likely. But since the spinner has no memory, these really are independent events, all of them. And so what do I do? I take the product of each of the probabilities individually, and I look at that for the answer. So in this case, to find the probability that we have a red, then a green, and then a 5, what we have to do is to find the probability of each of those and multiply them together. So let's actually do that. So what's the probability of each of those? So first of all, what's the probability of red? Well, how many reds are there? There's 1 eighth here, there's 2 eighths here, and there's a third eighth here to get red. So that's actually going to be 3 eighths. And then I multiply that, since these are independent events, I multiply that by the probability of green. Well, the probability of green is very rare, only one of the eighths. So we have one eighth. 
And then finally, what's the probability of seeing a 5? The probability of seeing a 5, well, there's a 5 here, but there's also a 5 here. So it's actually 2 eighths. 2 eighths, of course, is equivalent to 1 fourth. And so we have this product, which is going to be 3 divided by 64 times 4, which is 256. And so the probability, you can see, is very low. 3 and 256, 3 over 256. And you can see that I just tried to do it. I couldn't. Let me try one more time, one last time to see if we can do it. Here we go. I first have to get a red just to get off the ground. If I don't get a red, then the game's over. I lost. Oh, red. OK, here we go. Now, if I can get in the green, I'm still allowed to play, but I still have to get a 5 after that. So you can see why this number is so small. I have to jump through three hoops. All right, wish me luck. Please, green. Not very likely, as we predicted.